District Special Education Advisory Council. She sees herself as a learner in her journey as an immigrant and parenting a child with disabilities. Um, and she likes to do projects around her house, which I wish she would come do some around my house. <laughs> Sarah is the Director of Family and Community mm -hmm. Child Strive and sits on the steering committee for Homeward House. She is a clinical social worker specializing in attachment and trauma-focused therapy for children and families. She's a clinical supervisor and associate field faculty with the University of Washington School of Social Work. Sarah is re-educated every day by her four children, three of whom are adopted. She says they rate her parenting style as needs improvement. What she really likes to do is grow vegetables and um, take care of bees. And she would have all kinds of animals if she could. Mm -hmm. So um, they have a great uh, presentation for you today. And as in previous um, webinars, if you have a question um, of a technical nature, you're having trouble hearing or whatever, you can use the chat for that. If you have a question or comment, uh, use the Q&A and we'll be monitoring those um, as we go. And so I'm gonna turn it over, Catalina, I think you're first. So I'm gonna turn it over to Catalina and get off camera. All right, thank you, Terry. Um, well, hi everyone, and um, welcome to uh, this afternoon of conversation about how uh, we can intervene um, um, in early childhood to interrupt cycles of poverty and trauma. It's more like a conversation than a presentation. So um, what are we gonna learn today? Um, so today we're gonna, um, as Terry said, there have been two other parts of the series where they already went through the brain development. So we're gonna go very brief in the infant mental health and um, synopsis of secure attachment. Um, Sarah will go over the effects of poverty in the brain development and attachment. And um, we'll um, reflect on what contributes to the cycles of poverty and um, do a, also a reflection on ACEs and community level intervention. And at the very end, uh, we will talk about resilience and we will go over one case study and hopefully we'll have time for some conversation around that, okay? Um, so infant brain, um, infant brain development. So we have learned in the past two series that um, baby's brain organizes in um, uh, in a bottom-up approach. So uh, from the lower part of the brain, the, the children will learn how to feel if they are safe, if they feel comfortable. And um, if in the more internal part of the brain, they, that is the limbic part, they will um, learn if they're loved. And in the, just as the surface of the brain, they will learn, they, are, they have all the, the synopsis to get ready to learn. That's the part of the brain that um, kind of controls the attention and the perception and the awareness and the getting ready to um, start learning and connecting. And all those, uh, the structure of the brain and all those functions that those all uh, connections they require, require a relationship to develop, to get stronger, so the, the, the babies grow healthy brains. Um, and let me go back. Um, let me see my, my notes. Um, We also, um, yeah, we also learned that um, attachment is a, um, the relationship with a meaningful, meaningful person. So if we think in our lives, in our development, 
of a time that we have a, a relationship with either a caretaker or a teacher or a sibling that has been in our lives that we feel um, the same, that we feel safe, that we, leave, we, we feel loved and that we feel um, that connection, that we feel that we uh, really are part, part of somebody. Um, just think for a moment. So it's kind of what we, um, what we have here with this baby uh, gorilla that is having that pleasant uh, stay with, um, with his or her, her mom. Just, just being there, uh, enjoy uh, being around her uh, is so close, so intimate, and, and is really something that you will remember, remember forever, something that it will stay with you and stay connected with you. In attachments, we have, a, we also learned that there are some different types of attachment. We have uh, and we're not gonna go deep into what the differences in types of attachments today, just because we already have seen, we have learned from the other parts. But um, we can have disorganized attachment and we can have um, secure attachment and avoidance attachment. And right now we are concentrated in what is secure attachment for children. So, um, um, Dr. Alan uh, Score, who is a, um, a psychiatrist who has uh, learned about neuroplasticity um, and connections, um, he talks, he knows that the intricate wiring of child's brain requires more than just food. It needs, um, for children, they need to be felt that a safety to learn, to be ready to go in life and observe and, and explore and, and um, be held, uh, wanted to be part of, of their, the family's life, the environment's life. So um, definitely we're, we want our children to have secure attachment. And to have secure attachment, we, have, we need uh, children to be in, in, in environments where they feel um, safe, welcoming, they are relaxed, they, um, they are supportive, and they are, they are around nurture caregivers. So um, all of those uh, qualities, you can see um, that children, once the children are, have covered their basic needs from those uh, sensitive and attuned caregivers, um, children can develop secure and safe uh, relationships. Um, once caregivers are um, providing children with um, validating their feelings. So caregivers who, who are uh, engaged with children in, in a relationship that it has play, it has conversation. Uh, caregivers that are um, responsive to their feelings, uh, regardless or that is uh, they're having, enjoying the time or a child who's having a hard time. Even in a child that is having some uh, difficulties with their own emotions, if there is a responsive caregiver, caregiver who is validating this child's emotions and is connecting with the child and is providing that space for him to, for him or her to be, a, to feel comfortable, um, it will really a, a give tools to these ch these children, the children to uh, in the law in the in their life to handle difficult situations and, and build resilience. Um, we also want caregivers to be able to repair relationships in, in case they, you know, um, they have missed steps. 
you know, we all, we go over some difficult stress, stressful days, either to work. If we think about right now with the coronavirus in our current situation, we are going through difficult times staying inside our homes and sometimes not being able to have enough time for parenting, for work, or other difficult situations that could be um, losing a job. And, uh, and sometimes we, we don't spend quality of time with our children, but being able to you know, acknowledge and, and tell and have a conversation with the child or sit with the child for a quality of time and meaning and really reflect on like, you know, I really had a hard time but I really love you at our, or, you know, we could have some play time later. And it's not a time, no, it's not a quantity of time, it's the quality of the time and the connection. And the other, the other is caregivers that uh, set reasonable limits and boundaries um, because it gives kids, children a structure in their life. It gives them a um, security um, in their life. So we're um, gonna watch a, a video that it shows a, a beautiful interaction with of two children with probably their caregiver. Um, and it, will, it shows how simple it is to uh, just a simple play, just a simple song, how uh, this care, caretaker is connecting with the children. Let's see. I'm not sure if folks can hear or not, but if you can't, try to turn your volume up. It's just a mom singing to her kid. You want me to turn it on? <laughs> well, we can't really see what she's doing because she's off camera. I mean, you can see how much delight those children take in her antics. Yes, I don't know, Molly uh, and Terry, I don't know if you have from the chat if people were able to watch the video or and listen to the video, at least watch the video, how the beautiful I could children. see I could see it, but I couldn't hear it. Oh, okay. Do you want me to watch it again, to play it again? I think it's okay. I think you got the, we got the idea. Yeah, all, one of the panelists is asking, I mean, one of the um, participants is asking to share your sound, if you could share. Oh, so maybe okay. try it one more time. Okay. Um, no, it just goes. Um, When you get it started, if you could make sure that the volume on the YouTube is turned up all the way. Yeah, yeah. hold on. Um, is that it? It doesn't. Oh, I found it. Share computer sound. Okay, let's let's try. Sorry, sorry. There was I'm um, still learning some of the technology of the Zoom. So let's play it again and enjoy. Oh no! That's beautiful how she interacts with the little babies and they are connected connected with their eyes. Um they um 
they're really enjoying their time um, with her. I mean, just as simple as the song and just um, sharing how much they adore to, they, they adore each other, you know, how they, you know, trust, enjoy, they're connected, they're feel um, just the joy. The, so, the, panelists, the panelists are glad you uh, played it again with the sound. They said oh, that. Okay. <laughs> Sarah, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, it didn't cost her anything either. She just used her voice and we can imagine, you know, her expressive face and laughter and that was all she needed to bond with those babies. Yeah, and her excitement about being with those babies in that moment, that, you know, that really staying in that second, I mean, the video is less than two minutes. So, um, you know, really, really uh, connecting with, with them. So um, that's what it takes for um, adults to, who care for children to connect with them and really help them build a framework or noodle, noodle a partners. Um, so I'm gonna read, because this, this is very important. It's just a summary of what we just kind of learned in the past two um, series. Adults who care for children help them build a framework of noodle patterns that shapes the understanding of the world in which they live. Babies and children have brains that are shaped by their parents' brain partners too. Resilient or self-protective, exploring or conserving. So it really gives the children um, what we transfer to the children, um, the opportunities for the children to either go in the world and um, ready to learn, prepare to make um, friends, belong, or just stay for the children to maybe be more um, regarded or laid back. So it really uh, is, is the, those connections that we adults do with children really kind of give food to, to the brain. Sarah, you wanna add something? Um, no, I mean, it's just that these patterns, they become the template through which the children will appraise all other relationships as well. So it really is foundational to the way they start to see the world. Yeah. So we're going to open for questions, maybe Terry or Molly, if somebody in the audience have any questions, comments. We don't have any yet, but okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you know. Okay, perfect. So um, we're moving to towards um, more on like um, the brain, the, the healthy brains. Sarah. So um, the job of the parent is to kind of help make learning safe. And one of the ways that they do this is by establishing that kind of connection with their child. Deborah Gray was, um, she's a, an amazing mentor of mine who works with a lot of kids that have trauma. but. What she has described in her book is that children's brains, even at very, very young ages, can tell the difference between real emotional availability and the polite, distracted signals of a preoccupied parent. And where that really, you know, we're starting to see some effects of parents sort of being on their cell phones or, you know, they have so many different things going on. And um, what we can tell is that children learn better and more quickly um, from a parent who can actually put distractions aside. Now, that's really challenging to do, but um, go ahead to the next slide, Katalina. She's the tech guru here today. So here's another little video. And while we're watching it, think about what we're just talking about in terms of attunement. How can you tell that this father is attuned to his child? How can you tell what the child uh, seems to be getting out of it? And can you see looping, positive looping of the interaction between the father and the child and enjoy? 
Go ahead, Catalina. Hopefully we get the sound on this one. Yes. You need to work on that, right? Yes, okay. Did you understand it, though? No. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, no, not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of this one. Okay, can I ask you? Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that in. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, go somewhere else with that, but don't break here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I said. And then it was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do that here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I love that video because, it, again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. You don't really need anything special to engage kids. Um, they even have just kind of the TV going on in the background. But it's all about the relationship between the two of them and how each of them play off each other. And so think about that just in terms of language development alone. Um, what it is to have a parent who is continually responding to you, encouraging you, pushing you, giving you all kinds of different expressive language to use and just finds delight in who you are and wants to keep that conversation going. Um, one, okay, of the, so next, next one of the panelists said they're even moving their heads the same way. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And if you know families, like I remember watching my brother read together one day and I'm like oh my gosh they walk like our dad I mean you just you pick these things up from your parents in really subtle ways so again the job of the parent is to make learning safe um, children need to know that they're safe by a parent who's constantly kind of protective and keeping those um, good boundaries um, Adele Diamond is a um, amazing uh, she studies basically executive function, her interest is really in how kids learn how to learn, essentially. And so she says that to push the limits of what they know, they need to feel safe. They, to venture into the unknown, they need to know that they're safe. And to take the risk of making a mistake or of being wrong. And in that particular point, she expands on it to say that you know, all children need to know that it is okay to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. It is part of learning and that there's nothing wrong with that. And so the parent can really lend their, um, their just love for their child and that reassurance to their child that it is okay to stumble and it is okay to be silly and not make any sense at times. But the fact that, um, that they're out engaged in learning, that's the important part. Go ahead. So this little video, I love it. It was um, created for educators to try to help understand what changes for kids in terms of their ability to learn when they are having to scan for safety all of the time. So watch this um, and uh, we'll be thinking about it just in terms of keeping the back of your mind. Like if a family is growing up in an environment that isn't necessarily well resourced, may not be totally safe, what type of brain are you more likely to be uh, living with? Go ahead, Catalina. Hey, welcome back. Today, I really wanted to think about what's the best way to teach teachers about trauma without getting them distracted with all the technical stuff, and what's the most important thing for them to understand and learn? And I thought that the best way to do it might be to just make a difference between a learning brain versus a brain in survival mode. So we'll just call it learning brain versus survival brain. And this is the difference. So learning brain is this brain that's open to learning new information and it's completely okay with ambiguity and grays and vagueness. And it sees the big picture. It like pulls back and is on the balcony, can look over the forest and figure out what's going on. 
on an emotional level, people in learning brain feel calm, peaceful, maybe a little excited about what they're about to learn, maybe a little playful and having fun too, and definitely curious. And they're not afraid of making mistakes because it's just part of the learning process. And so they're not really thinking about themselves. And they actually feel a little bit of confidence that if they just apply themselves, they might pick up what they're trying to learn. Now, survival brain, on the other hand, is completely different. It's hyper-focused on threat. It doesn't like ambiguity. It wants clear, hard facts. It thinks in black and white terms. It doesn't want anything to be gray at all. And then emotionally, you can imagine that survival brain makes people feel panicky, feel like a little obsessive and afraid of getting things wrong. And they don't feel calm and open to learning new things. They just want to get things over with. And people in survival brain also really don't like making mistakes and they are afraid of looking stupid too. So students in survival brain don't want to be picked on. They don't want to raise their hand and ask questions and look stupid. And so these people are also filled with doubt about their own ability to learn stuff. And they're afraid that other people can see how stupid they really are. Now it's really important to understand how learning brain and survival brain interact because survival brain always trumps learning brain. And it makes sense because survival brain is just trying to save your life. And so if it thinks that there's something dangerous happening, you better pay attention to it, right? But the tricky thing is that as survival brain stays on longer and longer, it's harder to get out of that. And it's harder to really go into a learning brain. And the way I think about it is kind of like the myth of Sisyphus. You know that guy who has to push a rock up a hill and then every day it falls back down and he has to do it over and over again? Well, being in learning brain is like being up on the high parts of that mountain. You can see the expanse of what's going on, but it also takes a lot of work to be up there. And at any second, if you're not paying attention and make putting effort into it, it's so easy to slip back into survival brain again. And that rock that Sisyphus is trying to push up, well, that's kind of like stress. And the more stressed you feel, the heavier and bigger that rock gets, and it just pushes you back into survival brain quicker. Now, the kicker is that for traumatized people, Stress is a really rigid and intense thing. And so with trauma, any little stress makes that rock grow way bigger than it normally would. And because people with trauma misperceive ambiguous situations as threatening and stressful, that rock just stays big all the time. Now the good news is that the more you control stress, well, the easier it is to be in learning brain, right? Because that rock is a lot smaller. And what I really want to highlight for teachers is that the best way to keep students in learning brain goes back to why I spent so much time talking about attachment. Students best learn when they feel like they're safe and supported by the adults around them. So it's kind of like a baby elephant. You know how like on those nature shows, the baby elephant is like playing with leaves or exploring a tree or something like that and having a lot of fun. And the only reason why they can do that is because there's a whole group of mama elephants around that baby protecting it and looking out for danger. So a kid with trauma or who's stuck in survival brain, it's kind of like that baby elephant who doesn't have protective adults around them. They can't play and learn because they're way too focused looking out for threat and danger. So this is why I really believe that the most important thing that schools need to focus on, way more important than any kind of techniques or curricula, is really whether or not they are creating that environment where students feel like they're surrounded by these big mama elephants who are going to protect them and watch out for them and make them safe. And when students have that, I bet you it unlocks their curiosity, their eagerness to learn and play as a way to learn. So I hope that's helpful. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Thanks. I love that video. Love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of the toxic stress that comes along with poverty, but just thinking about in simplest terms, when we say, how do we move someone out of poverty? I mean, we're really thinking, well, we need to get them connected to a great job, right? I mean, you need to get paid. Um, so what he was talking about at the beginning of the video where like the survival brain doesn't want to think in terms of shades of gray, doesn't want any ambiguity. The creativity is blunted. Um, probably their interpersonal skills are not awesome because they're in that defensive protective mode. Well, who do you want to hire? Probably someone who has that creativity, who has the ability to see things in more than one way, who's flexible 
who's sociable. I mean, you're at a disadvantage in life if you start out in survival brain. You're not likely to be getting those really great jobs that we talk about lifting people out of poverty. Okay, Katalina, next slide, please. Okay, so I really want to make this point loud and clear that we're going to keep talking about poverty and the inadvertent strain it puts on learning and on family life um, because it contributes to high levels of household stress that just, they stay at high levels and they just don't go away. But at the same time, I want to be super clear to point out that poverty is not a cause in and of itself with bad parenting or parents that cannot create secure attachments. I mean, there are so many great families out there who are doing the very, very best they can. Um, so the, the point of this conversation is to be thinking just in terms of generalizations, but I mean, at the bottom line is all parents are really trying to do the very best they can. Um, but thinking about that big picture again, go ahead, Kathleen, the next slide is another video. Think about this in the back of your mind as the video is going. Um, just sort of what, um, what are the hurdles for families in terms of helping their children learn and grow? And sort of what are the barriers that just exist at a systems level? So go ahead and magically. <laughs> Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two from eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. 
Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. Jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so as I said before, uh, poverty itself is not going to be causing, um, you know, disruptions in parenting or the, the inability to create a secure attachment. But w there are so many things in, about that environment when you're growing up with uncertainty about where you're going to get your next meal or what, how you're going to pay the next bill that certainly detract from that ability to have, you know, the urban return relationships and just fun together. Um, you know, as we're talking right now, my kids are at home right now watching TV because I was like, do not go anywhere. I have a, you know, I'm going to be going a couple of hours. Just, just be good. Please God be good while I'm gone. Right. So there are, um, these are a few things that I was just listing in my head as, as far as things that can get in the way. Um, food insecurity is a big one. So for lower income families, um, Dr. Ben Danielson at the uh, Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, he calls this the hustle. He says it's just a continual um, outside space in the mind of a parent, like how am I going to get what I need to keep my kids fed and give them you know, the nutrients they need. And it's often about just making that dollar stretch as long as far as it can possibly go, right? And that might not be the most nutritionally adequate food around. So that's one potential issue. Also loss of family members by violence or through divorce or incarceration or displacement or any number of things. I mean, families are constantly being split apart, it feels like. And, um, we have so many single parent households right now. A lot of people ask me, like, because I'm a single parent, they see me doing relatively well, apparently. And they'll ask me like, oh, well, you know, it's, it, maybe it's not that bad. And I'm like, I wouldn't wish this on anyone, right? You need to have other people who have your back as a parent. You need to have someone there for, you know, when you have multiple kids with different needs and you can't split yourself and be there for both of them in different ways. So it's a real challenge to um, really be able to maintain that kind of close uh, attachment relationship that we're going for. So of course, the cumulative and intersecting impacts of sexism, racism, xenophobia, ableism, all kinds of discrimination that adds a whole nother layer of stress onto families, right? Do you get that job or you do not get that job? Are you passed over for one benefit or another? Um, we see this contributing to just parents feeling under so much pressure, it's even hard for them to maintain their own, like uh, just kind of regulation, their own stable um, mental health. Intergenerational trauma, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then chronic disease, um, it can be caused by chronic stress, but then it also contributes to chronic stress. Uh, because again, that's you know additional disability people face or medications they need to take or visits they need to make. Um, and so all of these type of things just kind of build up to a level where what any one of them might be really manageable or a parent may have the inner resources to be able to cope well, but you start stacking these up. And I mean, I don't know who could be coping well by the end of this. Okay, Catalina. And so as we've been talking about, I mean, there, these things just get in the way, right? There's also um, a lot of information now that chronic stress that a parent will be feeling can cross the placental barrier and compromise the development of a fetus. So before they're even born, they're affected by chronic stress. Um, caregivers having to work multiple shifts, not present for kids, um, have unstable hours, you just can't predict that level of income. 
it's hard to provide the level of engagement that kids need, that predictability that you're going to be there for them. Kids may feel pressured to grow up quickly, contribute labor or income. Uh, as I was just mentioning, affordable childcare is the television or tablet. That is certainly my uh, nanny right now. And COVID has made this all, you know, most parents, if you are lucky enough to be having a job, you are relying on your uh, caregiver of choice, tablet, TV, whatever you've got at home, because you can't do both things at once. So exhausted caregivers, you're just less flexible. You're not up in that part of your brain that can process a lot of information and remain um, balanced and creative and let's figure this out together. You go back down to that primitive level of your brain where it's just about survival. If your neighborhood is one where you don't feel safe to be out um, and playing, getting that physical activity, that can be a real challenge. It can also be really hard for kids, especially right now with COVID, not getting that outlet um, for their physical activity. They're not the most pleasant people to be around, let's face it. They need that outlet. They need to be expending that energy in productive ways. Poverty can start to feel normal and inescapable, especially across generations. And so adults may just have not on purpose, but inadvertently just start to have lower expectations of what their children will achieve in life, okay? So I love this picture of this mom. I'm thinking she's like, just take the damn picture and let me get back inside. <laughs> she's really doing so well. And all parents want to do the best they can for their children. They love their children. They would pursue any possible resource for their children. That is most parents anywhere. And it's sort of up to the rest of us, in my opinion, to be providing the kind of environments in which they can thrive. Okay. I have another video here that's brief. It just goes into a little detail more about how toxic stress affects the brain as it's developing. I thought it was really good. So Kathleen, would you mind sharing it for us? As we develop, our brain produces 250,000 neurons every minute. By birth, we'll have 100 billion of these miraculous building blocks. But in order for our brains to fully function, we'll need synaptic connections to organize and build networks. Who we become and how we function depends entirely on how these networks develop. And our interactions with others and how we've been treated determines everything from functions like heart rate, breathing, and basic emotions, to personality, decision-making, language, social behavior, and voluntary movement. We know that severe or prolonged abuse or neglect derails that building process, even in the womb. Distress and high anxiety in the mother allows cortisol, the stress hormone, to cross the placenta and disrupt development. When the toxic stress response is activated repeatedly, brain development, and even immune systems are disrupted. Research has shown that high doses of stress hormones inhibit brain function and impulse control, overbuilding the fear center and the part of the brain that's critical to emotional regulation. TBRI uses three sets of principles to begin the healing caused by toxic stress. By recreating the developmental process, TBRI strives to introduce the nurturing that was absent in those toxic situations. And for the child who has endured toxic stress, healing must begin with a sense of both physical and emotional safety, something this child may have never known. Connecting principles are designed to create and nurture healthy relationships through sensitivity, consistency, and availability to disarm fear and gain trust. Giving full attention, using a gentle voice and kind facial expressions and body language are just a few of the ways to help build trust. Punitive and controlling responses only feed a child's mistrust and fear. Empowering principles are designed to meet physical needs, including sensory regulation, nutrition, and hydration, and strive to be aware of environmental issues, such as overstimulation by light, noise, or smells that can trigger behaviors that often leave caretakers baffled. The goal of the correcting principles is to help guide a child through day-to-day -day strategies, 
by correcting fear-based behaviors and establishing felt safety, helping a child regulate their emotions, tell their stories, and learn through playful engagement. The Adverse Childhood Experiences study examined the effects of multiple types of abuse in childhood, and the staggering results showed that high doses of childhood adversity affect brain development drastically, leading to addictions, attempts at self-medication, impacted immune systems, chronic inflammation, and autoimmune diseases. The greater the number of traumatic events, the greater the damage. TBRI can help stop this ugly cycle. There is hope for the damaging effects of toxic stress, but it will take dedication, education, and most of all, understanding. So TBRI, if you're interested, you can find a lot online. Um, Karen Purvis did a lot of work with kids who have um, been adopted, who have experienced a lot of traumas. And so um, you can easily Google her name and all kinds of stuff comes up. And the correcting principles are really just um, ways that parents or caregivers can engage with kids to help mitigate the effects of trauma. And believe me, it is way harder than it sounds. <laughs> so to the next slide here, um, we've been talking about this trauma level of toxic stress that is just kind of always part of the environment but then we have further stress that can come about through events or series of events um, as the last video clip was just highlighting um, that really do start to interrupt what would be a normal brain development process um, and it really kind of undermines relationships so one of the things that can happen is that a parent who has experienced something traumatic um, will have these overt or subtle cues to their child that that situation, that exploration is just unsafe for them. And so a super simple example would be like a parent who maybe was involved in a near drowning, okay? Without having to explicitly say to a child, water is unsafe, don't go near water, there may be thousands of small little micro things about their behavior that children do pick up on that let them kind of develop their own inner awareness that water is unsafe, learning to swim is unsafe, I shouldn't be, you know, learning to swim. That's just a super simple example, but there are multiple things, like if you can think about a parent who, while growing up, maybe had abuse um, by a man, well, a child can kind of come up with their own schema about men being unsafe just based on those cues that a parent gives a child throughout the course of the day. Um, in the circle of security model, we call this shark music. So it's like the, the little jaws music that's going on doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, in the back of the mind of the parent. They are not even aware that they are making these cues to their child, but it does get in the way of a child feeling safe to learn. Um, children with actual, their own trauma exposures, as we talked about in the beginning, they are in that survival brain. And so they are spending all of their time scanning the environment for, do I feel safe, more than they are able to explore their world with, with some freedom. And then if both the child and caregiver have suffered trauma, their relationship and may be at risk and child development impacted. And so I, I used a picture about forced removals of children from their parents at the border because it's, it highlights just perfectly the sort of perfect storm of issues. So for a parent in that situation, when they were trying to find um, you know, a better life for themselves and for their child, and they'd already gone through so much, now they're having to deal with, you know, of course, the loss of that intimate relationship they must be feeling potentially regret. Like, why did I, I didn't know this was gonna happen. Why did I come here? Guilt, it was all my fault, you know. Um, and then their own level of anxiety is just sky high. Like, what's gonna happen? It's, it's so uncertain. Where's my child gonna go? Who's gonna take care of them? And then for the children, I mean, even a child as young as the one in this photo, you can see the wide eyes, the concerned look, you know, the furrowed eyebrows, She's kind of arched back in the arms of this guy because she knows, even at that very young age, 
um, that there has been a handoff. Now she's with someone she doesn't know. Who is this person? Are they safe? Am I safe? Where's my parent? When will I go back to my parent? Like that's all that that child is processing, which is plenty. That's a lot of information, but that doesn't allow for them to be developing language, developing relationships, developing, you know, that, that explorer mindset um, that most infants and toddlers, we want them to be in. Okay, go ahead, Catalina. And so uh, very similarly for kids who are in foster environments, we talked at the very beginning that an attachment is really just an, an enduring, strong, emotional connection to someone. It doesn't say that the quality of that connection is always positive or a secure attachment, right? And so we, as a society, sometimes step in and say, well, this child is at risk of harm if they stay with a parent who is maybe substance abusing or homeless or, um, you know, hitting a child or whatever. Um, the problem is that that person for that child is there stability, as unstable as the situation might be. And so um, we're really asking a lot of a child to be taken out of one home and be able to establish some kind of attachment with someone else. It's very traumatic. Their brains just can't even process that loss. Um, and we know Charles Zena is also an attachment um, specialist and he says that we know infants and young children cannot sustain attachments over time and space. They need regular, ongoing, substantial contact with their parents. So if you think of yourself as an adult, um, there are people you are attached to and they may be far away from you. They may be people you can't visit right now because of the stay at home orders, right? But for me, I can think about my parent who's in another state and I can sustain my feeling of attachment for her, even though I don't see her every day, even though she hates Zoom and I can't even Zoom with her. Um, I can do that as an adult. An infant and a very young child cannot do that without having that ongoing contact. So um, there was a question that came up in the chat about um, racism and uh, institutionalized uh, discrimination against children. We actually have a really nice issue brief that was just created that we want to make available to everyone about this. But this um, is in that brief. It talks about how there are just such high disparities for children of color in the child welfare system. So for example, uh, African American children were found to be almost twice as uh, likely to be in the foster care system based on their the number uh, in their communities, while white children were actually underrepresented. Um, so that's just one element to focus in on um, as far as disparities affecting um, early outcomes for children. Uh, next slide, please, Katrina. So, we know that you know parents pass on their genes. There's other things we kind of briefly talked about that affect children before they're even born, right? We talked about the you know high levels of stress hormones and that type of thing. We also know that there are factors that seem to be associated with changes in just the way DNA is expressed, um, including adversity and racism including whether or not they have a sensitive caregiver available. It's like, what brings out the best in you, right? You hope for someone around you who will bring out the best in you, but these are factors that actually get in the way. Um, next slide, please. And there's a name for some of these environmental changes. It's called epigenetic. You may have heard about it. It's kind of a newer field in microbiology, and I am not a microbiologist, so I am not going to pretend like I know all the details about epigenetics. The big picture is that there are things that go on in our environment that may impact, so those little light switches are um, like protein groups on the surface of um, part of the DNA that will actually activate or deactivate pieces of the gene expression. And so if you have social conditions and life experiences that like, let's say are just really, really hard, um, 
children can get some of those uh, light switches switched on or off because of the, the survival advantage it may incur that it's passed through the experience of the parent. The problem is that these are not necessarily things that um, help you over the long run and they can often be associated with health conditions later in life. Um, next slide, please. So um, the last thing I would say about epigenetics is it's, it's a field that is changing very rapidly. We're learning so quickly. I really encourage people to kind of delve into that a little bit more. Um, but what I really want people to take away is that children are born, as I said, already at a disadvantage because of some of the experiences of their parents and their grandparents. So one that is getting a little more press lately is that um, more than 700 women die in the U.S. from complications for pregnancy or childbirth each year. That alone is terrible. But um, black women have a mortality rate, and I've seen it, many different estimates of what the mortality rate, but it's as much as four times higher than white women. Um, and this doesn't really make sense. There's not a genetic reason for this, right? We were just talking about genes, but I'm not talking about like genes being the reason. It is because there are so many social factors that influence rates of preterm birth, just for one example, um, and babies being born lower birth weight, um, access to preventive care, maternity care, um, whether parents, you know, have healthcare providers who listen to them and, and hear their concerns and follow through. Um, when a woman says, you know, something's just not right, I just can't quite put my finger on it. Um, so we see poorer outcomes and we know that um, part of the issue is also a cumulative load of stress that comes from racism, sexism, and other forms of stress. So we can't really tease apart any one thing, right? People have looked to see, is there a gene responsible for this? It's like, no, <laughs> you cannot just tease one factor out. They all really play a part and so the takeaway for young children is, how fair is it in life if you were born already kind of at a disadvantage compared to, if, let's say if you're a black baby and you're or uh, birth weight, uh, your mom had complications in the hospital, you're really struggling to breastfeed, like you're just not starting out life on the same playing field as, you know, a white baby who's born like, if you're from my family, you're like way over birth, normal birth weight, you are a chubby baby. And, you know, you have every resource sort of available to you, including the attention of healthcare workers. Um, so going to the next slide, there is um, a field of re reproductive justice that really, I, this was so important, I wanted to have it in here verbatim, but it, reproductive justice is a human rights based structured approach that addresses the intersecting systems of oppression that prevent marginalized women, primarily women of color, from achieving complete bodily autonomy and parenting with dignity. Reproductive justice recognizes that a woman's ability to determine her reproductive destiny is linked to conditions in her community, including her access to healthcare, affordable housing, economic opportunity, and other factors. And this goes on to say that if you are a policymaker, you'd be doing um, your best to be focusing on those community level interventions that help everyone, but in particular families that are really at risk of um, maternal mortality or infant mortality. Next slide. So quick pause just to see if there are questions at this point, we've covered so much material. You have a question, you can type it in the Q&A. <clears throat> you don't have any right now. All right. I do. All right. Are you ready to move on, Catalina? Yes. 
Okay. Um, Sarah, but I would like you, you wanted to do like introduction and, and I do the exercise. Sure. Um, so the picture that you have in front of you, I, I know you can't probably read all the little things and that's sort of by design. Um, just focus in on the image of that tree. This is a tree who's growing in soil that is not, um, it's not robust. It's not a great environment for this tree to be in. So it's roots are weak and they don't go very deep. The branches, they're trying to strive upwards. They're trying to grow um, leaves and fruits, but this tree is having a really, really hard time. So in this sense, the tree is representing um, the, at what's below the soil is the environment that it's growing in. And then the upper parts of the tree are what the actual experiences of uh, let's say a family growing up in a, such an environment might be, right? So we, we wanted to ask all of you if you could think a little bit about that soil that that tree is growing in and think of it as um, kind of the equivalent of what are some factors in the community that do not foster a thriving family that are actually adverse community environments. And we invite you to just type things into the, um, the chat box there of like, what are some things that you can envision in this community that lead to poorer outcomes for children and families? What characteristics, what things you notice about such a community? <clears throat> so what Sarah and also um, what I want to share is that when we talk about adverse community environments, it's not only like the eco environment, it's like, you know, what she was talking, um, just a simple example, discrimination, for example. Um, um, street violence, a food desert, um, things that really make it harder for families to thrive. So uh, one comment is uh, both parents needing to work on affordable housing. Okay. Yep. What other community level characteristics do you all think might lead to adverse experiences for families? Poor education systems, lack of equity, access to community factors, no affordable care. Yep has added police brutality and fear of police in communities. Sure. Um, lack of parks, recreation, affordable clubs, uh, lack of public transit to reach parks, libraries. Mm -hmm. and I like that point some, uh, Rihanna made before that the lack of, there might be um, community resources, but if they're not available to everyone equally, then it doesn't really do any good. Right. <clears throat> Lack of access to affordable health care. Okay. So going on to think about what would be the logical fruits of this kind of environment? Like what would you see in families as a result of living in this environment that is not very nourishing? Go ahead and type things into the chat box. What would show up in a family if they were growing up in such an environment? Uh, being stuck in survival mode. Okay. Anger, depression, ADHD type behaviors, anxiety. A lack, um, lack of community support, ability to make friends and connections. You guys are good. <laughs> uh, malnourishment, health issues, dental problems. Um, low income, high dropout rate. Um, cycle of poverty, being an invisible community. 
toxic stress, possible abuse, uh, frustration from the kids uh, to not be able to do things that all the other kids get to do, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, um, yeah, uh, death and incarceration of family members. This is not the most uplifting slide, right? <laughs> So, but this uh, is what and family yeah. breakdown um le legal problems mm -hmm. so one of the reasons we put this slide in it's actually part of two so we'll move to the next one in just a minute but um do you think if you so there's this there's this i i guess it's like this myth in america um that you know if you work hard can just make it right like if you if, even if you're born into poverty you, if you strive you will make it somehow some way right that's if you grow up in this level of community i think it, it really turns that idea on its head i mean we are only part we can only thrive in the kind of environment we're in um, and so families through no fault of their own they're working hard, they're trying hard, they want the best for their children, but they may not have access to the types of things that actually may lift them out of this environment and out of poverty altogether. Does that make sense for people? Should we move to the next slide, um, yeah. Kathleen, and all these poor, depressed um, audience <laughs> members here? <laughs> Do you want to lead this one? So, um, yeah, the, the other slide is very depressing, but it's the reality of some communities. So for, for, for us that we are um, just thinking about what interventions, if we have, if we nurture the soil, if we um, provide nutrients to the soil, or uh, to get uh, obtain or obtain different outcomes, um, what what kind of nutrients should we have in in a supportive environment in a community? What could we have that it promotes um, um, healthy brain development, um, cohesive uh, communities in? Um, what could be the, the nutrients that thinking that you can think of um, to make the lives of the families or the environment of these families to for them to thrive? If you have ideas on that, go ahead and type into the chat box. Community partnerships, strong education and community values, supportive resources accessible to all, regardless of socioeconomic status, uh, support groups. Um, uh, positive community relations and events such as well-maintained parks, parades, focus on diversity, resources for minority groups being <clears throat> as actively promoted as those for non-minority groups, uh, educational opportunities, social service resources, mentor, unity in the community, and affordable housing. Availability of mental health counseling, uh, support to help parents manage their own stress and unaddressed trauma, um, grocery store options in walkable distances. Mm -hmm. Uh, community centers with access to resources on site, access to healthy foods, supported schools. Yeah, so with that, um, with that soil reach of all those nutrients, the outcomes for the for children and families in communities are totally different from the, um, the previous view. We will have then what, what could be some outcomes for those families in those communities. You can share it in the chat, that would be great. Um, so 
So you're looking for outcomes that will occur if families are yes. doing these things yes. that the people have talked about. Yeah, so when we, when we think that if we have a good soil for this beautiful tree to grow and to have leaves and flowers and fruits, what could be those fruits and those flowers? What is the, the, yeah. the results of them? So hope is mm -hmm. one. Resiliency. A positive mindset. Families feel supported, thriving. Children have access to multiple supportive adults. Better ability to adapt and cope. Strong relationships and connections with mentors to help families strengthen their vision for the future. Become a visible community. Uh, driven to next steps. More family time with parents when resources are available. And also commented something very similar, saying people being able to participate in activities with families outside of work obligations. Mm -hmm. Set a goal, complete a goal. Um. Well, this little exercise is called the pair of aces, and it, um, it's something that's easy to do in community groups. Now you all know how to do it. It really gets a conversation started about what elements are either present or missing from your environment in, in, that would support uh, families' development. Catalina, do you want to go ahead to the next one? Yes, and with that, uh, we and, and I really uh, like it with that zone, people went to the areas of hope and resiliency because that's our next um, part of the presentation. Um, so from um, the Center of Developing Child Harvard, uh, of Harvard, I have, uh, we have this video on what is resilient because we, we talk about resilience, but what it, what really is really resilience and how can we see it in our children? So play the video. Why do some people do well despite serious hardships? The science of resilience can help us find answers. We define resilience as a good outcome. Sorry. I'm sorry, I was trying to, is, to, to have a better sound. Sorry. Why do some people do well despite serious hardships? The science of resilience can help us find answers. We define resilience as a good outcome in the face of adversity. The extent to which we can build capacities in all children early in their lives to be able to deal with whatever bumps in the road or major obstacles may be coming down the track, that's an investment in building strong human capital and healthy, productive adults. Some children face more obstacles and adversity than others. It's like having a parent with a major mental illness growing up in a very socioeconomically disadvantaged community, going to schools that are not good, being exposed to violence in the neighborhood or, or in the home. But some children do well despite these significant obstacles. Resilience is that ability or set of capacities for positive adaptation, allowing you to keep in balance. We're talking about the kinds of capacities and skills and the abilities that uh, give people a sense of mastery and management of difficulty. It's tempting to think about children as either having this resilient quality or not. But resilience is built over time, just as and in parallel with how the architecture of the brain is built over time. 
It's not just in the person. It's in the interaction between the person and the environment. So we care about resilience for the same reason that we care about promoting healthy development, because in many respects it is the same. We are interested in, in promoting resilience in children so that, despite the odds, more and more children can grow up to be productive citizens. So we're looking at resilience as an, um, you know, as adapting in the presence of risk and adversity. And almost like the same factors, the same elements that build the brain, the, the brain in the early years is what it really um, nurtures resilience in, in us. So that's super important to, to connect that as we are in helping children with um, connecting with parents, connecting with the community, with their family, and growing and, and uh, developing their, their brain, their healthy brain. They're also building resilience. And um, research, research says that um, for, you know, for individuals who are not an, an, uh, uh, exposed to adversity, uh, the same factors, they don't have the same effect, but for, for, for individuals who are in, um, exposed to environmental um, risk factors like poverty and disconnection and oppression, um, resilience is really a, a key factor for them to succeed. So what... Um, what do children and adults need to, to build that resilience? So children need to be connected with a trusted adult. So that part of the attachment that we talked about it earlier, um, feeling safe in their homes and their communities and to build that sense of, of self. So belonging to a community, belonging to a family, having uh, those tr trusted relationships and knowing that they are worth for uh, worth of investment, worth to be cared, worth to be loved, and as the as important as it is to um, invest in children, it's super important to also invest in the parents or the caregivers and those adults that are caring for those uh, for the children. They also need to feel that they have they are connected with their environment that they have social networks, that they could support them and their families, have skills, opportunities, employment, um, access to services, and feeling, feeling safe, safe in their own communities and feeling also respect. And we're talking about respect in terms of, um, um, we still today, nowadays, today, see that, um, why, why poor, the 8% of white poor families are under, are in poverty, but 20% of black families are in poverty and 22% of um, Native Americans are in poverty. And 16% um, of uh, Latino families are in poverty. So when we see the, that there is this disadvantage of uh, communities of color, that's when we talk about if, if we are investing in this port in these communities with anti poverty policies, why these communities are not nor, nor flourishing? You know, what, what is moving from like what is wrong with the families or what is wrong with these communities to what is happening in these communities? What is that in, in, in their environment that is not supporting the communities to flourish? to uh, what we saw in the aces of tree, the, the tree of a pair of aces tree. So um, for, a, for policies and programs, if we, if we consider the diet of the child and the adult, 
it's very important to also talk about how we build individual and collective re resilience, taking in consideration equity. Um, and equity in terms of um, do they belong to fam uh, families of, of children of color, do they belong to their, to their communities? Do they have the resources to, to, um, to thrive? Do they belong to the communities and are connected? They live in the communities, but are they connected to these neighborhoods with their services? Can they uh, find uh, employment opportunities or they have to just drive long distances to find opportunities? Are, are they welcome in their children's school? Are they, um, are they being part of the conversations when, when um, programs and policies in their area are uh, developed or created? So having in, in consideration that um, building individual and collective resilience is not just working with just the children or only the adults, it's working with the child as a whole. Sarah, would you like to... Um, I can hear you. Sorry, I, I muted myself because someone was vacuuming. Um, oh. I agree totally with what you said. You said it well. I think that's why United Way has really um, taken the tactic of investing in families with young children because we know, as you were just saying, like we need to root families in a sense of belonging and um, of support all around them in a holistic manner. I don't know if some if someone in the chat has any comment about it or wants want to participate or share something with us. Um, really um, yeah any questions talk, at this point before we yeah when we talk about um, 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 building individual and collective resilience uh, and, we, and we, we hear a lot in organizations and agencies that they're applying trauma-informed practices and that's very important but like also um, are they responsive to the communities that we are um, we're intervening are people in the community really uh, being part of those decisions do the, the, the people have the spaces to gather to have their children run and play freely um, do they feel like the, the spaces where or the places where they receive services uh, mirror their culture do they have people who look like them um, um, so we probably will have could have a lot of a, a big conversation around equity and in, in culture humility and supported environments but for for you know the topic of today is like really being mindful that um, certain communities are have been on their on their represented in certain areas and overrepresented in other areas and how important it is for us to consider when we provide services at individual level at family level community level like what is happening in terms of of access for families and for people you know how do we connect with with the people who are we are providing the services what are the results that the the, the people the the children are um, are the, what are the outcomes that the children we see in the children with our interventions? And sometimes is that disconnect with families and um, just the system of oppression, just having in mind like what are the systems of oppression and how can we intervene with um, having in mind this, the equity framework.
Okay. Um, I think with that, um, we, we have a, a case study um, with, the, with all the information that we have learned today and or in, in the past two um, series, we have a case study for us to reflect and I don't know if we wanna do breakout sessions or we just have a conversation on the chat. Um, and in terms of time, we have some time, Sarah? Some time and we have about um, 35 people so okay. so we might yeah we could either do it chat probably that's going to be the best way since we can't really see the participants okay yeah, let's keep our chat conversation going okay so um if you we have if you have the time and funding what kind of interventions would you target for this particular family and this is um um so i'm gonna oh, sorry In this time, I'm going to read the case study. And um, so, Lisa and her husband, John, and their two daughters were. Let's see. Sorry, I have my, my panel view over the writing. So, um, so I'm going to read the, the, the case study. And after that, we, maybe we can, uh, we would like us to comment on like what could be the resources and the approach that we can have uh, to support this family and kind of like to nurture their soil, to nurture the soil so they can have, um, they can be helped to thrive and we, they can be supported. So Liz, her husband, John, and their two daughters who are two and five years old, um, they live in the basement of Liz's parents since after Liz lost her job as a bartender due to COVID-19 pandemic. Liz's siblings didn't agree with them living with their parents, so they recently asked them to move out of the end of July to avoid conflict with the rest of the family. Liz has, is four months pregnant, but her family doesn't know. John has a hard time keeping a job or wearing recovery in the past. The children are covered by Apple Health, so they have insurance. Liz did some college, Parents own a car, a car and do not have any savings. Some family friends have helped them with groceries and other necessities. Um, John, Liz and John are living under their, a lot of stress, job insecurity, limited resources to access housing. They have to follow the stay home order due to the pandemic and they must deal with unemployment applications, monthly medical appointments and searching for jobs and housing. Sorry, I'm just trying to move the, this view thing. Um, so let's comment in the chat. What could be, what could be the, the, the resources and the framework and the approach that we can uh, have with this family to support? And what could be the nurturing soil for this family to, to um, have resources and thrive and be connected. One person has suggested hiring social workers that can expedite the process and assist the family with managing applications so that parents can focus on childcare while staying at home. Also support for uh, housing due to COVID housing loss. Uh, another suggestion of parents as teachers 
mm-hmm. helping the family gain confidence in their skills as parents and helping connecting them with community resources and other um, possible connections. Food bank assistance, uh, support in housing forms, emergency housing, housing navigation, a suggestion to seek resources based on the culture and needs of their family, uh, financial counseling, Uh, connect the family, uh, the, getting a plan in place, uh, increased budget for Apple Health coverage, especially offering prenatal care. These are all really good suggestions. I like uh, that a lot of them are actually um, trying to aim fam- that family in the direction of hope as we talked before, just to keep that hope alive. Like this is, it's, it's not going to be where you are forever. It's just, we're, we're in a difficult place right now. Right. A resource center where they can get help for issues, a one-stop shop. Um, (laughs) Aside from telling the siblings to mind their own business. (laughs) Uh, Section 8 or PBV housing in the area of their choice, access to education in order to find living wage jobs or supportive employment, prenatal care and child care education for kids, uh, support housing, food, etc., help meet basic needs, then find counsel and support for job skill retraining, community college, child care. There are some county funds that are just about to come online, um, as well as some city funds in different municipalities um, that would help a family like this with, um, with costs that they are, you know, that they're, that are, key, that are holding them back that have occurred because of COVID-19. Um, so that's something to look for. Um, They've been in recovery, so a support group that meets virtually to ensure continued emotional support and sense of community. One thing that is also important is to address what they already have. You know, they they are together, so they have a family. They have friends that have been helping them so it's so very important. They have transportation, so they own a car, even though they don't have a lot of, uh, probably a lot of cash, but they have transportation to move around if they find a job for either John or for Lise. Um, um, it, it- it doesn't seem that they have health issues right now, other than the recovery. It's very good, yeah. The thing mm-hmm. that's going through my mind is like, we've got so many really great ideas here about helping them through like, you know, processes of applying for this or that. But like, bottom line, the system is so messed up. Like, how can you so easily go? from being employed with a place to live to like not being able to afford anything. I mean, we got to look at that in terms of what um, families can actually earn and what does that even get you? Because we were talking uh, earlier when Catalina was talking about statistics of poverty and the numbers of children living in poverty in different groups. And we're saying poverty in that sense, that's with a federal definition of poverty that is insanely low income. I don't know who can live on that, even twice that. And so I think thinking broadly about what systems I would target, I would probably look at, you know, why does it cost so much to live where we live? And why is that so unattainable for families and really try to pinpoint, you know, actions legislative or otherwise that would maybe just make it a little easier for families to get by. 
Right, and I know there's there are some, and others um, here might know more about it, but that there are others, um, there's work on setting the standard um, by the, um, I think the median median income rather than looking at poverty for Snohomish County. There are some good uh, comments in the chat that I was going to share. Um, mm -hmm. That Cat Catalina, they appreciate your pointing out that it's always good to recognize the assets a person are, has already as you try to assess what else they need. And um, Catalina, looking at family strengths, families sometimes willing to help um, friends, car transportation, being able to support each other. So it's just me reiterating Catalina's yeah, yeah. point. Yeah, and one other point, and thank you for your comments. One other point is like um, going back to kind of the main topic of today, I mean, the party and the brain development. How do we support this mom for her and, and the mom and the, and the dad and the other two children to still keep that hope and keep developing and growing? And, uh, and for that, those two parents to receive that child that is coming, you know, and, and enjoy that part with, with all what is happening within the family. That's also right. very important because that's going to be the key elements for that child coming to have a healthy brain development. The, right. the, yeah. Um, so, because so there, yeah. Sorry, Catalina, go ahead. Listen. No, just listen. Definitely. Well, ahead, Derek. one comment was, um, and, it, and it sort of speaks to what you're talking about, Catalina, is access to AA or NA resources digitally so the parents can have access to community support with individuals um, from uh, similar backgrounds and likely experience mm -hmm. similar trans, uh, stressors. Um, and just the dignity of, of having that community that understands, I think, mm -hmm. be very helpful to that. So if the parents can deal with their stresses and have that support, then they're more able to be available to that infant when, the, when that baby. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And that's kind of the point. The, I think the other day, uh, I think it was last week, I don't remember, Sarah, when we have the, the um, um, prenatal task force that we talk about a similar similar situation, but a, a mom who is going to have a baby and don't, and they don't have a child care if once the 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 mom goes in labor. So where are the kids going to go while mom is in the hospital having the baby? If like the the father has to go to work, you know. Uh, let's, I mean, think about like what kind of resources can be put in place for that family to be stable while she can have the baby. She can have like be totally focused on like, I'm going to have this baby and I'm going to be okay. My family, my other children are going, children are going to be fine and my husband is doing what he needs to do um, or either be with her or, or working. You know, that's another part of like, you know, how are they going to handle that in six months or in, in you know, five months that she uh, is going to be having the baby? Yeah, and for some families, they don't have uh, those trusted adults who can stay, step in and take care of uh, the babies. Yeah, I, I was thinking, especially now right? When we're not allowed to kind of just go over and help right. out. My neighbor has a newborn, I think she's about a month old now, and I heard her crying last night, you know, because that's what babies do about eight, nine o'clock at night. <laughs> and I wanted to go over there and be like, I'll take the baby. Just, <laughs> right? And, and I couldn't, I right? Yeah. I, there's so many limitations right now that we really need to think about because they may be with us for s some time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. from the chat, there's a comment that um, with a five-year-old child, they could contact their school district and okay. the school district is oper offering help with resources right now. Absolutely. 
So I don't know if um, this takes us off off um, yeah topic, well, but I I just started reading the um, book um, How to Be an Anti Racist, and in just looking at the system of racism and how it um, from a very early age creates a, a, a situation where a child of color thinks less of themselves um, because of their color and how that prevents them from being able to access supports um, and you know just the whole system that uh, reinforces that belief um, that the child picks up and how it leads to poverty. Um, unless something occurs that gives that child a different message that they are, you know, that they are worthy, that they, um, that they are smart, you know, um, that they can learn. Um, but just that insidious um, system that reinforces itself limits people's opportunities. And um, if you haven't, I just started reading it, but it is a, it's a, an amazing book and really um, quite accessible to read. He's a great writer. I, I also ordered the children's book, uh, Baby Anti-Racist, but um, it hasn't come yet. I think it's back ordered. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's another thing that we can all do, especially those of us who are white and have have benefited from from our privilege is to understand how to be an anti-racist. So we've got um, Rihanna gave us a YouTube to watch. Oh, hi. We also um, at the end of the the slides here we list a whole bunch of resources because we knew there was no way we were going to fit it all into this. Uh, yeah little short time we had together. And so we really encourage you to go look at those references. Some of them are videos. Um, most of them are less than five minutes. Um, so I'm really looking forward to watching this and seeing what that one's about. So thank you for- well, Thank you. Thank you for all the comments in your, in the chat boxes. And um, yeah, this is just a reflection on like one case. It's very true for many families. And if for this family, as Terry says, on top of that, we kind of leverage that if they, there are a um, family of color or, or they are mixed race, I mean, it put, it put them in a, in a, in a higher risk or it put them in a, in a, in a more, more vulnerable situation for them to really, um, move, get mobility and, uh, um, and succeed and access to services. So yes, um, I think with that, I think we are all covered. I would like to open for questions and other comments. Um, Sarah. Anyone else have questions for Sarah or Catalina before we close? Molly, is, it's true, right, that folks will get a copy of these slides as well as that issue brief that I sent you about um, the toxic stress of racism and xenophobia. Yeah, and this is the references. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone will get a follow-up email. Um, Oh, one more question before I keep going about next steps. Um, someone's asking about a level-headed approach to people who tend to get really hot-headed about uh, these topics, specifically the All Lives Matter debate. Do you have any uh, thoughts about talking to this, talking to other people about these subjects? I mean, I, I do. I've personally had this coming up a lot lately. The best advice that I got, um, I, I, so in general, what we want to stay is in connection, in relationship with people, right? And so it's so easy in this really divisive world to get 
as you say, fired up, hot-headed, you know, entrenched in your own view and, and just defend it to the end, right? We all do that. The best advice that I got uh, from a colleague of color is that like, take, you've got to let it simmer down. You have to take this anger out so that you can still engage in a conversation with someone else. And so what I've been trying to do kind of my last couple of weeks reflecting on my own efforts toward being anti-racist is that I need to have more of these conversations and try to engage people who are upset and to bring their level of upset down by being empathetic and not shutting them down right away. So I have a cousin who kind of spouted one of these like, you know, white lives matter. Like, why aren't we paying attention to this and that? And I was able to just kind of engage him and say, you know, yeah, all lives do matter, don't they, right? Like, let's look what happened in this instance for this guy. You know, he was treated very, very poorly, right? And so, but the difference though, the difference that we're talking about is that, you know, for this victim, this African-American victim, they're part of a pattern, right? It's not just this sad thing happened, this terrible incident happened, this wrongdoing happened. It's that this person was part of a pattern that has persisted for hundreds of years and mushroomed into um, a system that kind of perpetuates itself. And so we were able to have this conversation, but only when my own level of upset I was able to handle it and bring it down so that I could meet him on that human level. And so that's not easy to do at all. But I think that right now, more than ever, what we can lend with our whole intact brains and hopefully good relationships that are shoring us up, what we can lend to the conversation is that calming response of like, I do hear you. And I care about that too. And it, isn't it terrible? Bad things are happening. What can we do to start making a difference so that the, the conversation can shift, right? We don't want to be talking about this forever. We want to see something change in the system to where we are treating one another the way they deserve to be treated. And at least in that particular instance, um, I was heard and we had a productive, you know, ongoing relationship. Uh, in people will shut you down. But I think that that, at least as an ally, I think to bring a sense of like uh, anger and indignation about it to the conversation, it doesn't actually really help the conversation. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, and I'm a person of color, but I'm not, I mean, I'm non-black person of color. Um, it's a whole different scenario. And I, I have conversation actually with my neighbors and um, they really differentiate like the, like, yeah, it's okay. It just happened. Why don't we get over it? So it has with a lot of, I will say self-compassion and, and being very firm. I just share some historic issues, some his some history of, you know, um, intergenerational oppression and just history because people either they don't remember or either forgot or either they didn't get their true story, this <laughs> true story uh, and more for what I have seen, like nowadays, younger people have access to more real information, true information. People who are my age and even older probably didn't get the true story uh, of um, Black and African Americans. So I think it's important to, you know, it's not personal, but there is a portion of education that is possible to do. And Everybody is at different developmental stages to understand, to absorb, and to really be, because it, talks, it takes a lot of humility to understand that what we are doing is wrong. So, uh, but still have a conversation. So people are very afraid about conflict. And from conflict, there are 
gray, gray outcomes sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's handled in a way that is like, I mean, it's not you, it's not me. It's whole, it's a whole system that we, and then we just could do a small part if we can and if we want, you know, because we don't want to re-traumatize other people to, on their own issues. So. I heard of a, a black woman, I think on television, who had a really great answer to this when you're at a place where people can listen, which is all lives will matter when black lives matter. Um, and, you know, if, if people can get to the point of having that conversation where they can hear each other, you know, because to me that really made a huge impact. So there's some great, great chats. I like this one that Nana has posted. She said, one of my favorite recent photos shows a white man holding one sign saying Black Lives Matter and another saying, sorry, I'm late. I had a watch. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true and I think yeah. I, what makes it so complicated too is that again like everything in the world like we operate in relationship right and it's very hard to scrutinize and analyze your own like in my family the white supremacy that has passed through generations like I can't tell you how challenging it is to confront behaviors I hate <laughs> with people I love right so it's complicated and messy, but I like what you said, Catalina, that sometimes there are really beautiful things that come out of conflict if you can right. embrace them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. That's great. Yeah. It, it, the early relationships and the attachment relationships in our life that you guys talked about in this presentation are, are so foundational just in life, but even in this conversation we're having. Um, I was in a training and the presenter told a story about a white woman who gave her mom uh, the new Jim Crow for Christmas and put a sticky note on it that said, hopefully now you'll be less racist. <laughs> and it was like, you know, the presenter was saying, what do you think happened? They didn't speak for months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that uh, mother-daughter relationship that was strong enough before could have been a really great foundational building block to have someone that she was comfortable with have that conversation with her in a more inviting way. Yeah. Um, I mean, th we are talking about white people educating other white people, which I feel like has a different set of responsibilities. You know, I don't want people to leave thinking that everyone has that responsibility to do that education. Mm -hmm. um, but like you're saying, Sarah, you know, the people in your own family, those are ones that, um, you know, we feel a lot of obligation and responsibility to help educate and help talk to and, and try to make it safe enough because we do have those attachment relationships built. And in the process, you get to uh, practice your executive function. <laughs> yeah and even maybe use your, your other attachment relationships to aid you in that right. I uh, got off a zoom call recently and my husband whose dad is Mexican and mom is white had been talking to his mom and she had been you know using some all lives or blue lives matter conversation and he got so frustrated at her and was like trying to explain, but he was just not in the space to do it. So I got off a work call and he came and he was like, okay, we need to help my mom out. Can you help me calm down? Can you help me find an approachable resource that we can, you know, use and have another conversation? So, you know, I saw uh, attachment relationships being used to have the conversations and to prepare yourself to have the conversation. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, this has been a great presentation. I thank you, Catalina and Sarah, so much. I wish the whole crowd could be part of the conversation. Um, and maybe we'll figure out a, a way to do that um, in the future. But uh, any 
uh, we, we can hang around for a few minutes if people have um, other questions. Um, uh, but if not, if thank you very much for attending. And Molly, you were going to finish this up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, everyone will get a follow-up email. You will get the recording of the session, as well as all the resources and videos that Sarah and Catalina have mentioned, as well as the registration for part four, which is going to be Friday, July 31st from 9 to noon. So we'll see you all back here in about a month. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.